So we're going to talk today about finding your roots in Italy. And I'm joined here today um, by our special guest, Eric Lanzieri. Hi, everyone. So, and I'll, I'll begin by telling you a little bit of story about how uh, Eric and I uh, came to know each other. And that was about almost two years ago, too, right, Eric? When, yes, it was. Um, he had contacted me at Family Tree Tours, um, a heritage travel, to ask my, uh, if I would like to be interviewed uh, about heritage travel. And I said, yes, I would. And it was um, a project that he was working on with, um, I don't know who, somebody from, he told me that they were going to be um, making a TV station out of this or TV special about this. And um, that's on Roco TV, I think. And we'll talk about that a little bit at the end also. But we did an interview and that was just about two years ago, close to it. And he emailed me a couple a um, month or two ago and said that it's um, finally finished and, and that this interview is up on this um, TV, um, a Roku TV station that they've gotten. And what's it called? Uh, it's Roku, uh, R-O-K-U. And the name of the channel is Ancestry Stories. Ancestry Stories. Right. So that's how we, <coughs> how we met. And uh, so when he contacted me again and said that it was uh, ready, um, I uh, asked him if he would do this talk for us, so um, because he um, had a heritage <laughs> story of his own. So that's what I'd like to start with, Eric, is asking you a little bit of background about you um, and sure. where you grew up. I grew up in a small town in central Connecticut called Wolcott. It's about 12,000 people. And I yeah. still live there. And you still live there. And um, was this a big uh, uh, Italian uh, family that you had? Our family, uh, no, we were four children. Uh, but it's interesting, neither one of my parents had any brothers or sisters. So we didn't have any close aunts or uncles or cousins. Uh, we had distant aunts, uncles, and cousins. But uh -huh. we were not the big extended family, except for the fact that my mother's parents lived next door to us when, we, when I was growing up. And my father's mother lived only a short drive away in the larger city of uh, Waterbury, where my grandparents went when they, early in their time here from Italy. Uh-huh. Oh, interesting. I, I'm, that's surprising that you didn't have any um, aunts and uncles. That's interesting. Yeah. Uh, and so, as I said, I don't have Italian roots. I have done a little bit of research for other people um, in Italy because my understanding, I, I have a good friend of mine that uh, her last name is Lombardi. And when she found out that I was a genealogist, she asked me if I could help her to uh, try to find um, uh, some information on her grandparents because she wanted to get um, a dual citizenship with Italy and, and America. That if, if her uh, father would have been born um, before her grandfather had been naturalized, then you know she could have gotten this dual citizenship. But unfortunately, he the, the grandfather had been naturalized a little bit, not too long before her her father was born. So, um, so she couldn't get that. But uh, I thought that was interesting. The only couple countries that I know of, I think Ireland and um, and Italy, that you can get dual citizenship if you can prove this lineage. Yes. But my other, the only other thing that I kind of knew in was that the biggest wave of immigration um, to the U.S. from Italy was, you know, after the turn, in, after the turn of the century, the 20th century, you know, in the early 1900s. And that's about um, the same time that uh, your grandparents came, wasn't it? Whoops, you got muted. You got muted, Eric. <laughs> Is it on again? There you go. Okay, uh, my grandparents arrived between 1903 and 1906. Well, that, that was the, the immigration, uh, a big wave of immigration. And I think you and I discussed the other day, I was saying that from what I knew about this or had heard about Italians, and this happened with some other ethnic, ethnic groups too, I think, but more so for the Italians. <laughs> that they would come sometimes and just uh, work for a couple of years and then go back home. Um, you know, they wanted to make some money, and then, I don't know, was it possible for people to buy land then in their own country, um, or, or was that mostly owned by large uh, families and, 
and you just work the land? Or did you own your own land there? It was a problem to go back and try to be what we would think of as, as an independent farmer. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there, was, there was still a lot of uh, land system where there were a few people that owned most of the land. And many of the people who, who left Italy at that time, really we would call sharecroppers. They were living uh -huh. on, a, on a small part of the land and invested all their labor and kept very little of the benefit of it. Yeah. Well, that's that was part of the reason why that was part of the reason why there was so little economic opportunity, especially in southern Italy. Mm -hmm. And that's why, and maybe they just came to make money just to be able to survive and, and that. But because um, I did a little research after that, and I found that it was uh, 30 to 50 percent of Italians went back um, within five years sometimes. So, of course, we know that there's, uh, you know, uh, thousands of people that stayed. So, um, so you want to talk about your, your grandparents that immigrated in, in the 1900s a little bit? Uh, what about yeah, them? My, my mother's parents, uh, my, the, the book has to do with my father's parents, but to tell you my mother's parents first, uh, her mother, uh, her parents were from the province of Salerno in the south, and they went to Waterbury in the early 1900s. My grandfather, my mother's father, uh, his family was from Umbria in central Italy. Uh, they left Umbria and first went to Argentina, where he and one of his sisters was born. They returned to Italy. Uh, then when he was four or five years old, they went to a coal mining town in Pennsylvania, where they lived for uh, about 15 years. From there, they moved from uh, the coal mining town in Pennsylvania. The town was Jessup. It's right outside of Scranton. And uh, they moved to Waterbury from Jessup because my great grandfather was killed in a mining accident and uh, they, they didn't want to stay any longer, as you could imagine. Uh -huh. My father's parents, uh, he, um, we knew a lot about my, his mother. She was from the town of Scafati, uh, which is where I went back and found my relatives, as it's in the book. Mm -hmm. um, you'll hear me call it Scafati because that's the accent. But uh -huh. uh, <clears throat> she came to the United States at the age of 16. Uh, in the company of one of her brothers and a woman that later became her stepmother. Her father was already in Waterbury and had been here for three years. But my great, -grand my great grandfather on my father's side came to Waterbury in 1903 by himself. Uh, his wife had died in Italy. And uh, three years later, he was followed by my grandmother, one of her brothers, and the woman that he later married. And they lived in Waterbury. Uh, un until the 1950s, when both sides of my family moved to the little town where I live now in, in Wolcott. My father's father, we had the least, I had the least information on. I didn't even know what, where he was from in Italy. My father didn't know where he was from uh, because he died at the age of 33. Oh, and my father was a baby and didn't remember him. And actually what happened is my grandmother was very reticent to talk about anything other than a few funny stories about him because she never she never really got over his loss right. and you could nobody could bring up the subject she had a child she had a a brother who died in childhood in Italy and uh I didn't know about that until I was grown up and my father told me about it one day and he said the same thing about that he said she, you just couldn't he Talk said she it. only told me about it once or twice he said mm -hmm. it was a very painful topic painful. for her. Mm -hmm. um but my, uh, my father's father died in Waterbury at the age of 33. That was in 1923. Oh, wow. And was, uh, what was the big attraction in Waterbury? What drew, uh, was there a lot of immigrants that came into there for some work or something? Yeah, there was a lot. There were a lot of factories in Waterbury uh, on such a scale that at one point, I don't know which year, but at one point there were 30,000 factory jobs just in Waterbury. Oh my gosh. Uh, it, it was known as uh, the brass capital of the world because they made all sorts of brass products from wire to piping, uh -huh. decorative, pro decorative products, kitchen products, everything. And uh, they, there were three or four giant brass companies where you could get a job that would support a family without even yeah. speaking English. Yeah. There were, there were immigrants in Waterbury uh, 
there were four big immigrant groups. The only one that spoke English when they got here was the group from Ireland. Yeah. But the other three didn't. They were uh, French Canadian, uh, Lithuanian, and Italian. Oh, interesting. And they were they staffed. Uh, there were there was no question that you could find a, a yeah. job that would support a family once you got here. Was, and I I think that um, you know like a lot of um, groups immigrant groups like that there would be chain migration that somebody would say this is you know there's jobs here come on over and and so you had a lot of people that were drawn to the same area that if they knew that that's correct there's a there are a couple of uh, groups italian groups in uh, waterbury today that all came from the same small town in italy as you mm -hmm. call it chain chain migration mm -hmm. but the the town that my father's parents were from I don't think we have any, I never met anybody around here that came from there. For some strange reason, their chain went to uh, Providence, Rhode Island. Uh -huh. and if, if you drive to Providence, which is about, oh, maybe an hour from here, uh, there'll be a lot of people from the same town that, as my father's parents. Um, uh -huh. for, some reason, for some reason, they all went there, but how my great grandfather wound up in in Waterbury, I don't know. I'll probably yeah. we'll never be able to figure that out. Well, you know, maybe somebody else from his village wrote home and, and said it. Could be. So, um, Could be. so one thing I wanted to um, talk about and show was um, these passenger lists. And it, I had a little trouble with um, the uh, site itself. I, it said that it's under construction or, or, I mean, being revised or something. So I wasn't able to get the actual uh, ship's list. But um, for those of you that have never looked for um, your people on um, Ellis Island records, um, this is the website for them. And I, oh, I've got a handout too. I'm sorry. I've got a handout with some of the links that I'm, boy, I'm, I'm really bad today. I didn't put the handout in the notes. I'll try to do that um, by the end. And I also didn't do your uh, bio, Eric, which I will do that in a little bit, too, at the end when we start asking questions. I'll tell, tell people about you. I'm sorry about that. But anyway, they, the, um, uh, so you, I see the top one. I, can you see that? Okay, that, that's your grandmother when she came. Luigia, <laughs> yeah, is my grandmother. Uh, and how do you say that last name? Vocha. Vocha. Okay. Uh, I love Italian, but I can't speak it very well. <laughs> and, uh, and, it's a... It's a very common name in our town, but I didn't know that until yeah. I until uh, I went. And so she came then in 1906, and then he came in 1903. Now, did they? Uh, and I and you see, uh, if for those of you that maybe haven't used this, um, and especially for if you have Italian roots like this, after 1900 and after 1906, especially, um, this Ellis Island asked a lot more questions, and if you could get to the ships list themselves, like I said, I wasn't able to get to the, to the shot of that. You know, it asked where they came from, and as you can see, it's listed on the, on the um, index here, and I'm, I'm not going to put, because I would pronounce it Scafati. How do you say it? That's close. <laughs> Scafati. Scafati. Oh, oh, that sounds like a nice place. So if you're looking, you know, if you don't know the hometown for your people, this is a good place to, to try for it. And like I said, in the actual ship's records, occasionally, they will ask uh, where they came from and also ask where they're going, or, you know, who they're going to see. And so, you know, maybe if you just put your name in there and you're not sure that this is a person that is really related to you or not, let's say they had a cousin coming over, then if they're saying that they're going to, to Waterbury and you know that that's where your people live and it, and it had the same name, then it's a possibility that it could be, uh, you know, a relative of that. So, and the other thing I always tell people, no matter what, um, what the ethnicity they are, is if uh, your people were here, you know, earlier than when Ellis Island opened, which was in 1892, uh, check it after, you know, after that, those years, because you never know when somebody might have gone back. And you were talking about, was it your uh, mother's people or one of them that went to Argentina or something first? It, it amazes me how, you know, you would think that that trip would be so arduous why would you do that more than once? <laughs> Why would you, you know? It was unbelievable. When they, when, when they went to Argentina, they already had two children in Italy. And they left the two children with relatives. And they went, they went, <laughs> they went to Argentina where my great grandfather was working building train trestles, uh -huh. which, means, which means he was on a job that moved all the time. 
Yeah. So they they lived in a tent for two years. Oh my and, good. And when they came back, they had two more kids. Uh huh. My grandfather and one of his sisters. They stayed in Italy for a short amount of time. Uh, then my great grandfather went to New York alone and stayed there for about a year. And then the whole rest of the family followed, and they went straight to the coal mining town of uh -huh. Jessup, Jessup in Pennsylvania. Uh -huh. Following the following the work, you know. But oh. yes. Man, that, yes. That, well, that's interesting to learn their stories, though. That's what I find fascinating about family history is, you know, yeah, they lived in a tent for a couple of years. My goodness. Unbelievable. I can't imagine that. So that, those are my kind of tips about this Ellis Island. Do you have any uh, hints for um, using when you're looking for Italian? I'd like to say one thing. Um, uh, the, the passenger list, the passenger manifest is the actual handwritten list of passengers on the ships. And they're codified uh, in the boxes that you see on your video display right here. Yeah. I've done a lot of reading and I agree with the official position of Ellis Island, which sort of um, goes against the popular conception of the way that names might have changed from the original names to the Americanized names. That did not happen at Ellis Island. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a there's a misconception that it did. The passenger manifest, the handwritten manifest that you see on the Ellis Island website, was written before the ship left Europe, and uh, it was taken down by somebody who spoke the language of uh, the person giving the information and also could write English. Uh, then what happened was the ship came to New York. Those big manifest books, which were half the size of a table, were carried in to the uh, receiving room at Ellis Island. And as the passengers approached, uh, the person sitting behind the desk would ask the passenger now through an interpreter to confirm all the information about the passenger that was written down in Europe. Mm -hmm. And that, that was supposed to be a way of verifying uh, who that the passenger was who they claimed to be. Right. You, you could show up and use any name you wanted, but there, there were very few documents and if you look at the, the passenger search that you have on the screen now, the lower one for my grandfather, uh -huh. the first name is Mistake. His first name was Enrico. Oh, yeah, I wanted to bring that up. Mm -hmm. And it looks to me, there were, this has two mistakes in it that are kind of instructive. I think that the handwriting, if you look at the handwriting, whoever wrote it was trying to write Ludovico instead of uh, Enrico. Mm -hmm. Whoever, whoever read the record when they were digitizing it to put on the website, looked at the handwritten Ludovico and made Ludo Seco out. Mm -hmm. So there was a mistake on the first name made when he got on the boat in Italy, and another mistake named when they digitized it. Uh, and in fact, on his same record, if you look at his last place of record, or yeah. residence rather, mm -hmm. it's not Scafati, they have an L at the oh, beginning. Yeah. Yeah. That's the same thing. The person who read that handwriting, which is very hard to read, as you know, mm -hmm. the person who read that handwriting to digitize the record read the S as an L, and you can't blame people. Right. Uh, uh, but, but the only reason I'm so sure is that this Ludo Seco is really my grandfather, is that the rest of the information on his entry record matches what I know. Yeah. It's the yeah. right age, the right place of residence, and what really got it for me was uh, he was only 13 years old, but his occupation was listed as a shoemaker. Mm -hmm. And I know that his family were shoemakers in Chicago. Yeah. So I'm quite, and the, his, his destination, this passenger's destination was, it was Connecticut. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm pretty sure that's him. See, that's what but I mean is, is that they, they ask those questions on these later um, ships uh, or these passenger arrivals. That's right. It's a, this is a big clue. As I was telling you, uh, Kathy, one of the big obstacles to finding relatives in Italy is finding the exact hometown of the people you're researching. Mm -hmm. There was a tendency, common tendency, when you asked a person where they were from in the old country, they would name the nearest city to wherever they were from. And that's very misleading. Uh, this town of Scavadi is about 12 or 15 miles outside of Naples. And if you met my grandmother in Waterbury many years ago and asked her where she was from, she might have said Naples. Mm -hmm. And she might have told her family Naples. Yeah. And a lot of, I know of a lot of families that are mistaken as to where the ancestor was from. And when they get on Ellis Island or they have some other records to access, they find they've been 
they they haven't had the right town always. Right, and that's and that's a good tip because that happens not only for Italians; that happens for everybody. Is that okay. the majority of people stay the next biggest town that they come from because you know they don't, you know they I think remember, oh, nobody's going to know where that small town is. I remember just to show you how confusing it can be. Uh, my dad, that you can read a lot about in the book, uh, had a lot of patients in his medical practice that didn't speak English. And one day he came home and said to me, I was grown up, he said to me, oh, I had a patient, he said, I saw her for the first time. She's from Italy, she's from a town called, and he misunderstood the name of the town, but it's funny what he understood. He said, she's from a town called Castellama, which, which means the stars over the ocean. And actually, the town she was from was Castellamar, which is castle on the sea. Oh. <laughs> but he thought it was so he thought it was so poetic. Uh -huh. she was, he, what a beautiful name for a town, stars yeah. over the sea. <laughs> no, that it's Sea Castle. It's much, uh -huh. it's much <laughs> So the, the, the names and passing along the information are prone to a lot well, of mistakes. Yeah, and that, and see that's the way you the way people hear it, like you said. So that that's how it gets mistaken a lot of times when that happens. And I tell people I tell people that it's so critical because if you don't have the right town to start with, you'll never be looking in the right place. Right. And, uh, and Satchel Page, the old quotable pitcher, baseball pitcher, used to say, it isn't what you don't know that'll hurt you, it's what you do know you that know. isn't so. <laughs> <laughs> That's, very is, That's very true. It's very true. <laughs> and because genealogists sometimes will get it in, you know, they'll get it stuck in their head that it's, it's this way, the name was only spelled this way, and, and they right. have to come from this, and, and you've right. got to be open with this, because otherwise uh, That's right, right. you'll never find it. Uh, right. So, um, well, that, uh, and like I said, for um, the passenger search here on Ellis Island, I, I recommend that. And as I said, everybody, I've got a handout that I'll put in. I can't get into it now because I'm in the uh, screen PowerPoint, but uh, I'll, I'll put it in the chat at the end. And I also send out a copy of the a link for the re replay, and also I'll put it in there, too, because uh, I've got also the link for Eric's book, which I'm sorry at the beginning I didn't say. The whole purpose of this is to talk about his book called a story for Louise, but we're going to get into that in just a few minutes here. So, um, so they they came, they got to Ellis Island. Did they know each other um, since they were from? I Ellis? believe I believe that my father's parents knew one another when they were children growing up in the same town, uh -huh. because it was a town with less than a thousand people in it. They both went to the public school until they were twelve. They were the same age, and it was uh -huh. rare. For, it was rare to go to school until age twelve. They were probably in the same classroom yeah. uh, till they were 12 years old. And his family ran a shoemaking shop in the center of town that was probably known to everybody within miles around. Right. I suspect that they knew one another as children. And yeah. my father never knew that. It was among the information that I figured out that he never had a chance to figure out. Um, but I think they knew one another because when he came to Waterbury, he came to a town called Derby which is about 15 miles from Waterbury. But, and he later moved to Waterbury. And my father used to say that he never knew what made him move from Derby to Waterbury, but I think he probably was keeping in touch with my grandmother by mail all these years. Uh -huh. And uh, I think they found out that they were only 15 miles away from one another and, and he moved to Waterbury to yeah. be with her. Interesting. So yeah. when, what year did they get married in then? 1911. A 1911. Oh, that's when my grandparents got a lot. They got married. Um, I, have their, I have their marriage certificate, and I even have a wedding picture. It's unbelievable. Oh, that's nice. Um, and so, did they have a large family? No, they were married 11 years with no children. Uh, then my father was born in 1922, and my grandfather died in 1923. Oh, so just your, so just your father. So they just had him. And he was less than a year old when, when oh. my grandfather died, which oh, was boy. a shame. Yeah. What'd, she, what'd she do then? Uh, she, had been working, uh, she had been working in a factory that made pajamas. She was doing piecework. And uh, she, she worked constantly after he died because uh, she had to support the two of them. Yeah. And she became involved before he died. You can, it's all in the book. They bought a, a, a large piece of real estate in Waterbury together with one of her brothers. Uh -huh. And uh, they built a small building 
uh, that they ran a hot dog stand out of in the summertime. And she, and they did she did that as a second job for probably 20 years. Yeah. She bought and sold real estate elsewhere in Waterbury. She was very good at it. And she owned, she owned property until the 1950s. And she wow. even, I don't know how, I don't know how this began. Well, I'll just, she even uh, took another bit of the property they had, built an outdoor boxing arena, <laughs> and got, to, got together with a guy who was a licensed boxing promoter from, promoter from Hartford. And they had fights two nights a week and all summer long across the street from their hot dog stand. Oh my gosh! She was just she she enjoyed working and she was very uh -huh. imaginative, and she was a great businesswoman. Yeah, that's that's amazing because you know it's unfortunately um, there's lots of women that got you know the, everything put on. And my own grandmother, that I actually got married in 1911. Um, this was my mom's uh, parents. And he was killed in an, uh, in an accident when she was uh, five years old. And, and wow. my grandmother was left with six kids. And this was, you know, right before the Depression and everything. So wow. these poor women, they had to be very imaginative. <laughs> I know. To take care of their family, didn't they? I know. So she essentially had two full-time jobs for oh, a period of 25 years, or about 25 years. Wow. Other than, other than, you know, with the exception of those 25 years, she had one full-time job. Uh-huh. And that wow. was, inter as near as I know, that was interrupted only when she went one time to return to Italy to visit relatives. Well, that's, which, that's what I was going to ask you about. Did, did, they, did, she, did the families keep up a connection, uh, you know, after they did. came over? She, I know that she did. Mm -hmm. as, as for my other grandparents, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But I know that my grandmother uh, exchanged letters with relatives of hers uh, all the way up until the late 1940s, uh, which would have been some 40 years after she came here. So for 40 years, she kept up a correspondence uh -huh. with the people in her town. And she would put a few dollars in the yeah. envelope when, when she could. And it, it went a long way uh, in Italy, which was really flat on its back. Yeah. Especially when World War II ended and Southern Italy had been bombed by both sides in the war. Um, she decided at that point to go back and visit because she had a, an old, it was an old gentleman that she called uncle. I don't know if he was her uncle or a relative or a friend, I don't know. Uh, he was still alive after World War II and he was in his 90s. When her father came to Waterbury in 1903, he left my grandmother and her two brothers with this uncle to live while he came to the United States. And she and her two brothers lived with this uncle Erasmo whether he was her uncle, I don't know. Mm -hmm. they, they lived with him for about three years. And, uh, and then 40 years later, World War II was over. Uncle Erasmo was in his 90s. And she could, I'm sure she could use a vacation. So she, yeah. she went and she stayed for, she was there for about four months. Oh, I'm going to show a, a slide of where, where this uh, Scafata is uh, right. located there near Naples. It borders Pompeii. Yeah. From so the ruins of from the ruins of Pompeii, you can walk to my relative's house in fifteen oh, or twenty minutes. Wow! Well, I've, I've got some pictures of that. I'm going to show. So, um, uh, so how long did she you, did did she take your father with her? No, he was in college at the time. Oh, uh, she went. She went in the company of a, a close friend of hers, who was also a neighbor of hers here in the in Waterbury. The neighbor lived. In, I don't know a two minute walk from my grandmother and the neighbor was about 60 years old and she returned after World War II to visit her mother whom she hadn't seen in uh, another 40 or 50 years. So they, they went together from Waterbury uh, by car. They, uh, somebody drove them to New York City to put them on the boat. No. They took the boat together to Naples and once they got to Naples, they went their separate ways to see their respective families. Uh -huh. She, the neighbor came back first, and then my grandmother came back, and they hadn't seen one another, you know, in, uh -huh. the, four, in the four months since they reached Naples. It was four months later till they saw one another back in Waterbury. Well, that's interesting. And, uh, and now, I, I, don't, I don't think I've asked you this already. Did, you, um, did your grandmother die before you knew her, or did you know her? I was about 10, I was about 10 years old when oh. she died. Mm -hmm. So I remember her, but she wasn't well. And uh, 
I just have memories of a frail grandparent. Yeah. I wish I, I wish I had known her when she was well enough so that I, I would love to know what part of town she lived in. Yeah. Uh, et cetera. Well, you know, we always, when you're kids, you don't think about that. And then, you know, later know. you think, oh, uh, why didn't I ask her this or why didn't I ask her that? And I know. And, uh, so, so, so that, you know, so you were 10 years old and, and when she went back, you probably were too little to know that or even it might have been. Oh, she, the, barn. The, the return trip that she made to Italy was in 1946. I wasn't even born. Oh, yet. Yeah. So, and, and so was that, uh, did, well, of course, like I said, you were little, but uh, was it ever talked about when you were a kid? Um, no. When I got to be a teenager, and I, as I was growing up, I spent a lot of time with my father for a number of reasons. And as I was growing up, he started to tell me about her trip. And little by little, he eventually gave me a tremendous amount of information about the whole trip, from, the, from, from taking her to New York to what the ship looked like. Oh my! Uh, what she did while she was in Italy, who she visited, where she went, uh, and there's a couple of times when uh, they were in communication. They exchanged two telegrams while she was in, in Italy, and he explained uh -huh. to me all the he explained to me all the details of those. Um, but I learned that little by little, you know, in five minute segments growing up. Uh huh. And ninety nine percent of the information that he gave me was accurate. Mm hmm. And it was that story that he gave me, all now put together in my mind, it was that story that I had in my head when I went to Shkavadi when I was 31 years old. And uh, I started to ask around for, to see if anybody knew what I was talking about. I had no idea what I, who I was looking for. I had no first names, only last name. And, uh, and the, first, the first person I spoke to gave me the bad news that her last name is a common last name in this town of 50,000 people. <laughs> I was hoping that he would tell me there was only one family around with that name, <laughs> but it was the opposite. Mm -hmm. uh, well, <laughs> so you, things that, so you, you, know, you heard your dad tell these stories, and, and did that inspire you to want to go, or why did you decide that you were going to go? When I can remember being a little kid uh, telling my father that someday I wanted to go and find our relatives, oh. and he said, you probably, you can probably do that, he said. And as I wrote in the book, the other circumstance, another circumstance that worked in my favor was when my dad took, uh, when I spent a lot of time with him when I was, before I started school, actually, because my older siblings were in school, I was home all day, I got bored, and if, he, if it was possible, he would take me with him for part of the day. Mm -hmm. And um, among the other pastimes that he came up with to, to kill some time together was, he, he tried to teach me to speak a tad. And he tried the same thing with my older siblings, he used to say, but they didn't, catch, they didn't pick it up. But he said that the more he spoke to me, the more I understood it. Uh, uh -huh. he, he used to visit a few people at the time when I was little who were from Italy. One was an uncle of his. Uh, others were not related to him. And he used to tell them, I was little, I was five or six years old. He used to say, when I come here with Eric, we have to speak Italian because he's starting to learn it. Uh huh. They were so they were. Everybody was happy to to, to give me a hand, and uh, sure enough, uh, by the time I by the time I was in school and a teenager, I could speak pretty well. Um, and then I went on the first practice I really had outside outside of Waterbury. Mm -hmm. There were people in Waterbury that still spoke Italian at the time. Uh -huh. I loved to, I loved to practice. But I went on vacation to Jamaica when I, in 1991, and there were a bunch, there were a number of families there from Italy, to my surprise, and they didn't speak a word of English, and I had a chance to see how well I uh -huh. could speak, and I could communicate with them. Uh, I understood them; they understood me most of the time. Sometimes I would make a mistake, and they got a kick out of it. But I, after a week with them, after a week on that trip, I was convinced I spoke well enough to go. Uh-huh. So the following year, I, I went to Italy. I wanted to go look for my relatives, but for a number of reasons, which I'd be glad to tell you, it just wasn't possible that year. I got as far as Pompeii, and I saw a street sign for Shkavadi, and I said to somebody on the street, how far away is Shkavadi? He said, it's right here. And that's as close as I got. Oh. Oh. And a year and a half, a year and a half later, 
I went to Italy again and I stayed at a, on a farm with relatives of friends of mine in Waterford. And I stayed there. They said, you've never been there for Easter. You have to go for Easter. So I went. And they knew that I wanted to go to Shkavadi. They lived about an hour away. And they took me. That was the first time I went to Shkavadi. And that was the day uh, that I actually found my uncle, who was the first. I call him my uncle. The first, my first relative that I found was Uncle Simon, uh -huh. who, was, who was a distant cousin of my dad's. But he, but he knew my grandmother. He remembered her from the trip she made in 1946. Oh, wow. He was, a, he was about 19 or 20 years old at the time. And I, somebody took me to his house, and I was telling what I knew about her trip in 1946, and he was acknowledging that he knew the same things. And then I asked him a couple of questions, and he gave answers that matched what my father told me about my grandmother's trip. And uh, I, knew, I knew this was our relative. There was a resemblance. Uh -huh. uh, the, the accent and the dialect were the same. It was, it was amazing. So how did you find him? Well, <clears throat> when, when these people were kind enough to give me a ride to Skavadi from the farm where I was staying, and we got there and the car broke down. While we, were, while we were waiting about a half an hour to fix whatever it was, I saw an old gentleman in a folding chair in the parking lot. And I said to him, I'm here to look for relatives. I told him a little bit of what you know about me now. Uh -huh. And uh, I said, their last name was Watcher. I said, where would I look for these people? And he said, I don't know. He said, there's a lot of watchers in town. But he gave me directions to a street. He said, on this street, if you walk, you'll see half a dozen mailboxes in a row. All of them are watchers. Uh -huh. <clears throat> so these friends of mine were mortified when I told them I wanted to go. <laughs> they, dro they drove me to the street, sure enough, on the front door you saw a watch of five or six houses in a uh -huh. row. These two young fellas that brought me slouched down in the car, they didn't want to be seen. <laughs> and I knocked on one door after the other and said briefly why I, why I was there and nobody, nobody ever heard anything about an aunt that came from the United States or anything. Uh -huh. So I was ready to give up. Uh, by this time, it was lunchtime, and we decided we were going to buy lunch and then go back to the farm. We went to a deli and uh, ordered three sandwiches, and while the owner was making them, Gina, because she became a good friend of mine, this lady, Gina, was making our sandwiches, and I told the story one last time. She was looking at me and looking at me, and when I got all done, she said to me, I have a family of customers in this neighborhood whose last name is Vacha, and the father has a story just like yours. And she came out from behind the counter and walked with me 100 yards down the street, knocked on a door and called for Simon. Uh -huh. out, came, out came Simon Vacha, and uh, I knew right away he was a relative because he resembled my daddy at the same dark complexion. And uh, she said to him, this man is here from the United States because he knew a woman named Vacha who came back to visit here once. Uh -huh. And he's, he's trying to find out anything he can about. She didn't even say, she didn't even tell Simon that I was her grandson. Uh -huh. So he said to me, he was a very, he was a humble guy, said to me, sir, all I can tell you is I had a cousin who came here once from the United States. She's my father's cousin. She stayed here for a few months. She went back and we never heard from her anymore. I said, when did she come? And he said, oh, he said, I remember clearly. He said, it was right after World War II. He said, I was 19 or 20 years old. I said, what time of the year did she come? He said, she got here right after New Year's and she stayed until Easter. All this added up. Uh huh. I said, what did she look like? And he described her perfectly. So I, I said to her, I said to Simon, did she come to visit an old uncle that had raised her and her brothers when their father went to the United States and the mother had died? He said, yeah, she did. And I was just speechless yeah. by this yeah. point. Uh -huh. And he's, now he said to me, uh, he said, how did you know this aunt of mine in the United States? <laughs> I said, she was, she was my grandma. Uh -huh. And he started crying. Uh -huh. And, he, and, the, and the, as they say, the rest is history. Yeah. He put me in the car with the, these two guys that brought me to the town. And we drove across town about 10 minutes, and he introduced me to a few more cousins his age, one of whom lived in the household where my grandmother stayed for four months. And knew, she knew right away who I was. Oh, it was wow. Un, it was unbelievable.
Uh huh. And when I came home from that trip, uh, uh, my dad only lived another six weeks or so, but oh. I, I, I came home and I said, I found our relatives and he couldn't believe it after all mm -hmm. these years of telling me that I, I was going to be able to do it. Yeah. And I said, I promised, I promised him that I'd let him talk to you. So mm -hmm. I had the phone number and I called Simon from my father's house and they got on the phone together and they talked for 10 or 15 minutes. Aww. And, uh, it's the and it was really great to see because they each one knew that they had relatives in the other country. Mm -hmm. They couldn't put a first name to anybody, right? Uh, but now they could. And my father told me, he said he that on that phone call, uh, Simon reminded him of a few things about my grandmother's trip that my father had forgotten. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So he said this guy really did know my grandmother. Uh -huh. And then when I started to go visit them, I went a number of times. Uh, I, I certainly I brought photographs of my grandmother, and he said, "Yeah, that's her." Uh -huh. So I'm quite sure that uh, that what he told, what what I concluded that day was true. But I had so many coincidences in my favor. First was just the fact that I had a grandparent who returned to visit. Right. Not not too many did. Mm -hmm. I had all the information about her trip in 1946. Yeah. I could I could speak the language, and. And, and I just, by a stroke of luck, we stopped at the right deli to buy lunch, and it was 100 yards from my relative's house. Mm -hmm. And that's why I say there's really no substitute. Once you determine the right town you're looking for, there's no substitute for going there. For going person. there. And I, I, I always tell people, you know, I've been doing these heritage trips for um, um, 12 years or 13 years, and... Uh, it just seems that I always tell people, I think the ancestors are watching us, you know, I, when you get there and, and it's just these little things fall into place sometimes and like, I know. It's random, you think that this would happen, but I, I think they're kind of orchestrating <laughs> to, to help you. Find then, after I knew, after I visited them for years, they were so hospitable. And Simon and I had a really good relationship. We were so curious about one another and each other's countries. And uh, finally, I had known him for quite a while, and he said to me, are you related to the land series that had the shoemaking shop in the center of Shkavadi? I said, I don't know. Uh -huh. So that started me down a, another path, uh -huh. and I found relatives on the land side of the family now that I had a clue that they were from Shkavad. Uh -huh. And uh, all, uh, that's how I found that Ellis Island record we were looking at a short time mm -hmm. ago. And then in, in 2008... I think <clears throat> in 2008, I looked on, I would, I would Google things at random just to look. And I, I would Google Lanziri and the name of a town near Shkavad because I couldn't find what I was looking for in Shkavad. One day I Googled Lanziri and Pompeii, the word Pompeii. Uh -huh. And I got a hit on a young fellow named Nino Lanziri. And the only reason I got a hit on him was because he's a professional guitar player. And my father and his father were really good amateur guitar players. It was almost unbelievable. And I got in touch with him, and we exchanged information. And in 2008, I made a trip for a wedding in the Vaucher family, and that was the first time I met the Lanzieri's. Wow. And Mino, the guitar player, was the only relative I have who ever came to visit us in the United States. Uh -huh. He came to Wolcott in 2008, and he stayed about three days. He was here to perform, and he, he was on his way from Providence to or Providence to New York City, and uh, he stayed with us for three days. My father had a had a, a, a Gibson guitar that his mother had bought for him in the 1930s because he took lessons, and uh, Mino sat down to play it and was just so stunned by it because it's it's just a, an iconic instrument. Uh -huh. And after my father passed away. And after my mother passed away, I shipped the guitar to him, and it got there in one piece by some miracle. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and there it is. I'm so glad that he has. Oh, oh that's, that's, that's really special. That, uh, oh, it that's is. It's been, a, it's been an incredible uh, string of events, actually. So after now I have so, so many cousins and yeah. aunts and uncles, that, you know, where I grew up without any at all. Uh, yeah, well, that, oh, that's it. That's fun too, because uh, I know yeah. I, I uh, had somebody on one of my German trips, uh, a friend of mine, as a matter of fact, that um, she um, 
So she had sisters, but her both her parents were only children. So there was like you know aunts and uncles and that. And so right. I went back to Germany um, and made a contact in one of her hometowns. They had arranged to have all these cousins come and. and when she went in the room, you know, she got overwhelmed because she said, I've, I've never been in a room with so many relatives, you know, before. Right. Yeah. So it, uh, yeah, it, uh, so after this experience and, and, um, oh, I wanted you to tell people about how the, you, you said you spoke Italian, but you learned, tell them about the, when you speak Italian in Italy sometimes. Uh, I speak a very <laughs> old version of Italian <laughs> because when I was growing up, my father could speak standard Italian, but he decided or he, he told me later, he said, I figured if you wanted to learn standard Italian, you can take a, you can study it in school. He said, but I taught you the dialect that my mother spoke because you could only learn that from me around here. So he taught me a dialect that was spoken over a hundred years ago uh -huh. uh, in, in Shkavadi and in the surrounding towns. And it would be amusing because sometimes at my relative's house, I would say a word, that my uncle, who was in his late 60s, understood, but his children and grandchildren would laugh uh -huh. and think that, think that I made a mistake. And he would mm -hmm. say, no, he said, uh, Eric just used an old word. Uh -huh. it's, it's amazing. I've had friends and relatives who told me that certain, mm, certain imperfections in the way I speak are recognizable as part of an old dialect that was spoken in the rural mm -hmm. areas around Naples. And when you think that I learned it in Connecticut from a guy who never saw Italy, my, <laughs> yeah. either one of my parents ever made it to Italy. Uh huh. When you think that it was taught to me so precisely, it's it's yeah, amazing. That is amazing. And I just uh, want people to know that, uh, like other places too, um, there are many dialects, and that that's good part of the problem too with maybe reading records and and um, and speaking too. <laughs> that it's a dialect. Sometimes. People in this situation, if, if you speak a hundred year old version of a language, you're missing the words for uh, modern things like a refrigerator, uh, right. <laughs> or a lighter, or this or that. Yeah. You, know, you don't know where, because those words didn't exist when. Oh, I, I never thought about that. That's it. When your immigrant left, they didn't have all this. Stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. when, and my dad would know immediately sometimes if he spoke to an Italian person in Waterbury. There were times when he would say a word that his mother used that the modern Italian person did not understand. Uh -huh. And he had an expression he made up, I think. He used to say, it's another little gift that my mother left. <laughs> yeah. we, were at a, we were at a wedding once, and he asked to borrow the lighter of the Italian guy sitting next to him who hadn't spoken a word of English all day. So dad was speaking Italian to him, and he said, can I borrow your... And he used, my, he used the word alobat. Uh, the, the modern word for a lighter is cendino, which I never heard from my grandma. Uh -huh. she, she never heard that word either, I don't yeah, think. Yeah, it wasn't invented and then. <laughs> the, the, guy, the guest at the wedding said to my father, what is this alomet? And my father said, uh, it's another little gift that my mother left. <laughs> <laughs> and he had to make a sign to make a little right. oh, oh, that's funny. Uh, Cause that, that's really true, because when the immigrants taught the, their children the language... That's... Yeah, the word, the word oranges are... The origins are interesting because I tell that story in Shkavari and somebody explained to me once that the word that she used, this alomat, is actually a word for an old type of a candle, uh -huh. which was long, long and thin and made in that shape so that it would burn all night long at the house. Mm -hmm. and she was using a word that was related, but it was sort of as close as she could come to, to what uh -huh. she wanted to say. Yeah, uh-huh. It's when a lot of cases we have People in, in my in our situation linguistically, we know the we know the literal meanings, but not the figurative right, meanings. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, and it's very it's very interesting. Mm -hmm. I thought I knew two words for an orange. I thought they were just the standard Italian word and the dialect word. Uh huh. When I got to know my uncle, who was a farmer his whole life, he said but those are actually two different trees. Oh. How would we How would we know that in Connecticut? Yeah. I've never seen an orange tree in Canada. Uh -huh. There aren't any. You know. Right. But it's a very interesting experience. Yeah. And it's so, I was so lucky to have these word origin games. And yeah. I hear, in the course of time, I heard proverbs at my relative's house and expressions that my father used to use. Mm -hmm. It was, was really, it was amazing. Yeah. And that they're so distinctive. It's probably this way in a lot of countries, as you say. But different regions have different 
accents and expressions and proverbs. Right. My dad grew up in, a, in an apartment building in Waterbury. He used to say there were 24 apartments, all 24 apartments, everybody was from Italy. Uh -huh. And when he, when he was little, he and the kids his age didn't speak English, but they knew that in each apartment, the language was a little bit different. They could still understand it with one important exception, but they knew the language was a little different, but they didn't know why. Uh -huh. And it wasn't until they got a little older that they realized it's because they're from different places. places. They, mm -hmm. they didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, because you, you think everybody's from Italy, they all speak the same thing. Right. There were 23 families that could all understand each other. I don't want to offend anybody, but Sicily, Sicily has its own distinctive dialect. And for a lot of us, it's next to impossible to understand. And uh, there was a lady who lived down the hall. My father said, she seemed very nice. I lived down the hall from her for 18 years. I never knew what she was talking about. <laughs> <laughs> he, couldn't, he couldn't understand her either. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, that, that, uh, that's very true. There's so many dialects and, and people don't, you know, everybody doesn't understand each one of them. So after right. this experience, I'm sure it was very emotional for you after, you know, meeting all it these was. people. And, uh, but, uh, so how long after this trip or, or trips did you decide to write, write the book? A long time. It would have been, I found my relatives in 1994 and I wrote the book in 2016. So it was 22 years. Oh. In 2016, I got together with two old college friends of mine that I hadn't seen in 30 years or more. And they're both happened to be published authors. And I told them briefly the story of finding my relatives and they said, you should write a book about that. And, uh, and I did. At the time I had the time to do it. Uh -huh. uh, I said, you know what, I'm gonna try this. And I sat down to make an outline and I was surprised at how clearly I could remember uh, the events and the conversations. That initial conversation with my uncle, I remember verbatim. It's as if I, it was as if it, it's as if it happened an hour. It's uh -huh. unbelievable. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, get it written down before you forget it. And, right. um, and I liked one of your statements that you said about this on the, maybe on your website of that. And everybody, I'm going to ha have the links, uh, I'll send that to you so that you can look at, at this book. Um, uh, it's called Story for Louise, but it, you know, it, like you said, write it down before it to hand down to other generations or to you know before it's forgotten. And uh, right. I think that's what happens in families that you know the, the initial immigrants made contact for so many years, and then it kind of got lost. And, and, and right. like me, I, I was forty something years after the last contact that had been made with one of my ancestors' families, and uh, and so then it got you know, rekindled again some, so, mm -hmm. um, so. And these days, I mean, we sort of, I get dragged, I get dragged forward in time by technology. And here I am now, I, I use the latest technology that I use for, with my relatives is WhatsApp. Uh -huh. uh, it's nice yeah, because it's, you can, you can text, you can video call, you can yeah. phone call. And mm -hmm. uh, to think that, you know, over a hundred years ago when my grandparents came to the United States, it must have taken months to months. send a letter and get a, get a letter and get yeah. So it's amazing that they still had so much communication with each other. So I know. Well, and it's it's kind of sad. My father also said that <clears throat> in that building of the twenty four families, <clears throat> apparently there were very few that could read and write. I don't know how many, but uh, his point was that when somebody got a letter from Italy, oh. they would always ask my grandmother to go read it and write the reply. Uh huh. Yeah. That, that happened often, so there must have been a lot of them that, that couldn't read and write. Yeah. Oh, I think so. Mm -hmm. The illiteracy rate in Southern Italy was probably, I don't know, if I had yeah. a guess, seventy-five percent at the time. Yeah. I, I th like you said, I think it was probably unusual for kids to go to school, you know, until they were teenagers or that. I think. Right. You know. Well, um, and um, it, you know, was very interesting, and Thank I you. think um, lots of. Um, people I guess you were lucky though that you had that experience that you could just find so I want to uh, show a few little screens here on, on um, talking about research for um, for Italian um, ancestry and one thing I forgot to say at the um, and I'm going to show you some of these and they will be in the handout these links but uh, 
and maybe you can comment on this. It says, uh, keep in mind, this is from Family Search. keep in mind that Italian women typically use their maiden names on official documents in Italy, which means that on a passenger list, you will often find a woman traveling under her maiden name. So uh, that's just if you're starting to look for that, if you know your grandmother's or great grandmother's maiden name, uh, don't be afraid to use that to, um, to, in, when you're searching. So a couple of the places that Eric had told me that um, he might recommend, and I'm going to minimize here so I can see my screen a little bit more. Um, and this is an Italian, um, I guess it's a, like a genealogy site here. Um, and I, yeah. I've only got a screenshot of it here, so I can't scroll down just to show you any more. But um, it's got, you know, and you can, of course, my, my computer, I always have my, I use Google Chrome, and it's always set to translate it. But I always remind people um, a lot of times to go back and forth with the translation, because if you're looking for a name, sometimes the, the Google translator, whatever, will literally translate the words into, you know, something in English that <laughs> doesn't look like the same. So kind of go back and forth with it. But um, this site, um, I played around with it a little bit, and it's got um, like civil registers on there and, and some other different things, archives in the area. And I also, um, Eric, I went into, try to type this in again because I wanted to play around with it a little bit more. And um, I got this site, which is, I don't know if it's something different. Uh, is the, does that first word there, Antonati, does that mean? Um, ancestor. Ancestor. Uh, right. Uh, yeah. So this was another site that I found. And like I said, I, I've got links for them in the handout, which I will uh, send to you all. But this one, you can type in a name and the first name or last name, and it shows you all the different things that they're, um, where these databases are coming from. And um, you can play around with that. Uh, I, you know, like I said, I don't have any Italian, so I tried using your Lanzari no, name and um, some of the other ones, and they do pop up. It's people, you know, they're getting these from these different databases and also people that are um, posting their family histories, I think. So, um, those are two um, ancestor sites that you can use that are in Italian. And like I said, you can use your Google Translate to do it. I don't know, I, I shouldn't say that. I don't know, maybe they have an English button on here somewhere. Um, the other thing you wanna talk to them about these, um, this is the white pages and the yellow pages for Italy. <laughs> well, Kathy, you, you gave very official hints and here's my un, here come my unofficial strategies. Uh, the, my unofficial strategy of using websites for things they weren't intended for. Uh -huh. it's, all very, it's all legal, don't worry. Uh -huh. This site that Kathy has here uh, is the white pages in Italy. In other words, the telephone directory for individuals, not businesses. Pagine bianche means white, uh, white pages. Now, before I say anything, this, this strategy is less useful now that most people got rid of their landlines and have cell phones. When I first started to use this 25, when I thought of doing this 20 years ago, most people still had a landline, so they were all in the white pages. But if you isolate a town where you think your ancestors were from, and you have a last name, that's enough to use this site. Uh, forgive me, I have to use this uh, magnifying glass. On the, on the left, on the box on the left, the lighter color box, you put in the last name. On the right, you put in the town name, hit search. And uh, it's a clue in itself as to whether you get very many hits mm -hmm. uh, on that last name in the town you're searching. Right. If you get a bunch of hits, that's a good sign, I think. Mm -hmm. And you, sh you might also get interesting, you might also get a number of hits for people with that last name that have a first name that you have in your family, or you had older members of your family, you had three Alfonsos that you were related to that were all in your parents' generation. In Italy, especially in the South, they still use the custom of using the same name within families. Uh, um, for example, a firstborn son is usually named after the paternal grandfather which probably goes back to ancient Rome. Uh, but first names are used over and over again. So if, you're, if you have an Alfonso Rinaldi that you're interested in in, the small, in a small town, go to the white pages for the small town, put in Rinaldi, 
And if you get seven Alfonsos, it doesn't mean that they're all your relatives, but uh -huh. it's, a, it's an indication that you might be looking in the right place. Yeah. If you have another town in mind that you used to think was the true hometown of your ancestors, and you put in Rinaldi and there are none, that's an indication that you might be in the wrong place. Oh, so, so the white page is, is a handy, I think it's, a, it's an interesting thing. The other thing is each, each town and city in Italy now has its own website. And, and you can go there and it'll tell you a little bit about last names in the town, common last names. And that's interesting too. Mm -hmm. uh, um, the, way to find these, the way to find these websites for the town uh, is to use the word comune, C-O-M as in Mary, U-N-E, comune di, in other words, town of, and then if it was Scafati, you would put Scafati. Comune di Scafati, you could put it right on Google. Uh -huh. and, and you'll get to the official website, tell you a lot about the town, and uh, there'll be a section in there as to what common last names are, believe it or not. Um, I think I think on this one I showed here, I think, see this last names here? They, um, you can put in last names there too, and it kind of shows you where there's a big concentration of those names. So it's, that's, you have that's, a another, name. that's another common web, that's another website you can use. It's called, and I can tell you the name of that, it's uh, dif Diffusione, uh, D-I-F-F-U-S-I-O-N-E, Diffusion, uh, uh, diffu Diffusione di uh -huh. Cognome, Cognome is, la is last name, that's C-O-G-N-O-M-E. Okay. So if you're looking for, if you're using this last name Rinaldi, which is a very common last name in some parts of the South, uh, you would put in, you go to Google and you can, uh, you could put in Rinaldi and then type Diffusione di Cognome and it'll show you a little map of Italy shaded in different colors to show you where the concentrations are of people with that last name. Uh, well, that's a useful, that's a useful yeah. one too. I'll try to add that to it. Oh, interesting. Yeah, on that, um, because you know, like you said, you have to, I don't know, in Italy, I imagine it's true, just like a lot of other places, that you have towns that are the same name, you know, so, so, uh, you know, you have to. You do, mm -hmm. and it's conf that's confusing. That's confusing. So you have to figure out, um, you know, if there's more than one, and you don't know for sure, if you don't have any other kind of modifier that tells you that it's in, you know, so, right. you, you know, you have to kind of go through all of them to see, but uh, if you have some other you know, maybe you could tell by the language or the, you know, or some custom or something, so. That's correct. And now how do you use the uh, yellow pages there? I use the yellow pages if, um, if, you, if, if you're pretty confident that you now have a town, if you have the right town for your ancestors, you can go to, uh, instead of Pagine Bianche, you go to Pagine Gialle, G-I-A-L-L-E, and that's the yellow pages, and you can use it the same way. You can put in the last name that you're interested in, then the town that you're interested in, and hit search. And you might run across businesses run by people yeah. with, a last, with a last name you're interested in. That can be very interesting because a lot of these businesses have websites. You can go to the website. Uh -huh. A lot of websites have a section about us. Yeah, or their and history you can, or something. Mm -hmm. You can read a little bit of the history of the people that run the business. You might even see photographs of them. And I don't. And I just have to believe that whenever one, whenever somebody finds family overseas, you're going to meet at least one person that has a strong resemblance to somebody that you knew in the United States. Yeah, and that must happen all the time. Mm -hmm. It happened. It's happened to me. Yeah, me too. Uh, so that's Pagine Gialle. The yellow pages is very. I yeah. think is very useful. And I've got, as I said, I've got the links for that. And that's true because, like you said, with people going to cell phones more. But if they own a business, they're probably still doing it a business ad. Right. Somewhere, so. Or you can get, Pagina Jale will also show you Facebook pages. Oh, yeah. True, so true. if people have moved past websites and now they're doing yeah. Facebook, Facebook. Mm -hmm. you're still in good shape because you can still see all, you can see yeah. pictures and histories and stories on, on somebody's Facebook page. Well, those are good, good hints. And, and next I've got... Um, for everybody, um, 
I'm sure you're all familiar with FamilySearch.org, uh, and they've got this is the um, uh, Latter Day Saints uh, website that you know they've collected things from all over the world, and uh, they've got you know just a, it's a great primer for getting started with anything. So they've got Italian genealogy, and as you can see, all these different links. There's Italy letter writing guides, civil registration, birth document translations, and so I, I recommend that you start out there and start getting your feet wet if you haven't started doing your research yet. I'm also on their site from the Family uh, Search Wiki. I found this, which was very interesting, a brief history. Who were these Italian immigrants and why they left? So it gives you some background on that. It talks about the uh, passenger list and, uh, you know, it said a lot of some other documents that you might find, Italian immigration records. Um, when Italian immigrant prepared to leave the native homeland, he or she would have completed a passport application. Um, unfortunately, many of these applications were destroyed, but however, some still exist locally. And the other thing why I always tell people about, you know, especially um, if they've gone back, they had to apply for a passport here in the United States. So, you know, uh, and I think Ancestry has a lot of passport applications on their site. And so if she was going back in the 1946 or whenever she went, she would have probably had to have a passport so she could get back into the, to the country. So it, even if it wouldn't have shown up on the, the ship's record, um, it would be on a passport and where she was born because, of course, that's one of the questions that they asked. But this, the, this site was a little bit uh, interesting, too, because, like I said, it gives you um, other genealogy research tips. It gives you some background on when and why they left. Um, Let's see, they had, uh, oh, I told you about the, um, the name with the women. But anyway, um, I've, I've got these both, both these sites in, uh, in the um, handout that I'm going to send you. Sorry, I didn't, I'll put it in the chat just a little bit. Oh, so that, that's for the research. And I know we're kind of running over a little bit of time here. What time is it here? Yeah, a little bit over. So I'll, I'll make this kind of quick so that we can uh, have some time to ask some questions. I know I see there's some chat things in here. Unfortunately, I can't answer the chat while I'm uh, in the PowerPoint. So um, I'm just going to show you a few pictures um, about why I love Italy. And so as, as I told you, I don't uh, have any Italian roots, but I have had people from my German tours ask me about um, doing other tours. And so I've started, I've been doing a, a Tuscany tour for about um, oh, 10, 11 years now or something. We go to stay in a, a villa outside of Florence and then travel oh. around uh, Tuscany. And uh, so I just wanted to show a few pictures of that and explain to those of you that if you haven't been to Italy, why you will love Italy if you go. So, of course, this is a uh, scenery of, uh, you're going to see lots of scenery of, of vineyards and olive trees and, and beautiful sunshine. Whoops. And what I love, too, is as you're driving through the countryside, I don't know if this is, well, I've been to the south because I've been, I've been to Rome and, and uh, also I went to Pompeii, so I've been fairly close to where you're talking about. But as you're driving along, you know, you're just going to see these little villages that pop up on the top of, of hills. And I was wondering, you know, you know this, um, I always ask my driver guy there, um, because this was, you know, it, uh, Italy was comprised of a bunch of little kingdoms and, and things, and, and I, they built on top of the hills there for protection, right? So these mm -hmm. little villages were usually on top of the hills. So, you know, you drive through the countryside, and you see these beautiful little villages pop up. Um, also, if you go to the villages, sometimes they're um, these centuries old. This is Luca, I think, which is, still has its defensive walls around it and so many towers. It's either Luca or San Gimignano, which mm -hmm. I don't pronounce right. My, my Italian guy loves when I say that because I don't say it right. <laughs> but uh, anyway, you know, you're just walking in, in history there because they look the same as they did, you know, when you're, you know, if you're people were from there, it pretty much looks the same as when, when they were there, uh, you know, they're centuries, centuries old. And again, of course, we've got uh, vineyards and olive trees. Uh, the place that we stay at this villa, um, we're, we're on a hillside on, on top of a hill, and you just look out the front, and it's just nothing but these uh, olive trees, and, and uh, well, with mostly olive trees there, but down the hill, there's some uh, vineyards. Beautiful scenery. Wow. 
And we always do a, a wine tasting tour. So you see all these vineyards, and of course they are producing grapes. Um, and this is how they hang the grapes to, uh, uh, before they um, use them for wine, and which is my next photo here. Um, you have to have do a wine tasting when you're in uh, Italy. Uh, this is a, a beautiful place um, on top of a, a hillside again too with all those rolling hills of, of vineyards and we do a, a tour of the uh, winery and then have a wine tasting. But what I really love is to go to these little villages and just kind of walk the streets, these little winding streets. And I love all the doors, the, the different kinds of doors that they have. And, and I've, I've done that where I've taken just pictures of nothing but the doors. So that, uh, you know, because they're so, um, it's, everyone's different and they're just fantastic. But you never know what you're going to find when you, you, you know, you wander down the streets. You might come across a bakery um, there with some delicious macaroons. Uh, this was a city market that they had. This was in Florence, I think. This was, they have a big city market in, in the middle of town there where everybody goes on Saturdays. We did food tastings and wine tastings and, and, and bought some great uh, balsamic vinegar there. Uh, but you never know what you're going to find when you wander down these little streets. Then we wander to the coast. This is one of the um, towns in the Cinque Terre, um, one of those little five villages that hug the coast there, which is just absolutely gorgeous. Mm -hmm. And I love to, my favorite pastime in Europe, in most places, is sitting outside <laughs> and eating and, right. and stuff. So um, you, know, you can sit on the uh, port there. This is, you know, right next to the water and uh, I have a great, uh, lots of seafood in, in this, with these towns there too. And we also do a cooking class um, on this trip, and um, this is Morrow, and we uh, outside on this beautiful hilltop. Um, he has a covered patio with the sunshine and a beautiful view looking over to the next uh, uh, that San Gimignano again too from his uh, view. And uh, you know you want to heed what Italians say is to relax and slow down. Uh, Italy is a lot more laid back and they like to uh, relax and enjoy it. And uh, that was my loaf of bread <laughs> that I made at the, in the okay. class. We had a <coughs> and then on, we did a couple days where we went to uh, Rome. And, but this was Pompeii. This was my first trip to Pompeii. And as you can see, it was a rainy day. But, um, you know, it, that, that was on my bucket list is to visit Pompeii. So I was really close to where your, your uh, ancestors came from. But, you know, you can see the original uh, streets of Pompeii that they're, you know, people are still walking down from mm -hmm. um, centuries and centuries. And so when you are in Rome, oh, I forgot about, uh, this is, uh, do you recognize that? The uh, Bay of Naples and, uh, and the pizza from I'm looking at the <clears throat> at the photograph of the bay. Uh, we went to Mount Vesuvius, and yeah. uh, this was driving up to Mount Vesuvius. That's kind of yeah. Okay, and so you're looking you're looking north in this picture. Yeah. 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 Okay, I got it now. And that's uh, the you're looking. Yes. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say it was a, a beautiful. Uh, that my my picture is not that great, but it was a beautiful scenery. And then, and then, of course, you have the, the pizza from that area, which is, is that where they say that pizza originated, or what, what's the story? It's only a margarita pita, pizza? In fact, that is a pizza margarita. Yeah, that's right. Uh, which is, yeah, right. Uh, it just needs the, I'm looking for the basil leaves. Maybe, oh. it's, not a, maybe <laughs> it's not a pizza margarita. <laughs> no, it was. And then, you know, we were, you know, of course, they took us to a, a place that was, uh, caters to tourists so we would we would know you know but uh, uh so and they, beautiful. Were, they were trying to get out a bunch but uh, delicious then when you get this is trevi fountain in rome and it was you know you can see uh, this shot here you can see so many people in front of it and you know in the past year when they kept showing shot, shots of italy and all these streets uh, you know that were just you know void of any people at all as i'm thinking oh this is what it normally looks like but anyway they the custom there is if you throw a coin in the fountain there then you're going to come back to italy and it took me 30 years to to go back <laughs> to rome um finally but uh i've been there a couple times four times now then so um anyway it's it's 
just a beautiful, I love the language. I could just listen to people speak Italian all the time. It's very romantic and, uh, it's, you know, sunshine and warm and um, good food and good wine and uh, nice people. So. Mm -hmm. so, and that just my little commercial for family tree tours. Um, and as I said, that was not a genealogy tour, but we do, I have had people go on that that if they know their hometown, then I've got some contacts there and I have been able to get people. Sometimes they'll stay after the tour and, and go, or I had a couple people that uh, we went beforehand uh, to their hometowns. So we can do that too. So I'm going to um, stop sharing my screen so we can go back and uh, let me look and see who's got any questions. And uh, if you got a question and you want to unmute yourself, I'll, I'll look at the chat here and if I've got anything. But if anybody's got a comment or a question, and I'm going to, um, I'll try to see if I can put, uh, if somebody else has a question that they want to ask so I can, uh, can you email us the links? Yes, I will. And Anne Marie has the name distribution also here. So if you're looking, can you look at the chat? And you can uh, I'll say that. Uh, this uh, chat so that uh, I can get that link for you. Kathy, have you heard the have you heard the information you mentioned? The uh, it's so interesting to look at the doors on old buildings. Uh -huh. Have you have you heard the information that sometimes you can determine the approximate age of a building by the side by the size of the door? No, no, I haven't. The shorter the door, the older the building. Yeah, well, that that makes sense. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> All right, link to the book. Yeah, I've got the, um, I've got the, it's a story for Louise, and I've got that in the handout that I'm going to try and uh, and put in, in the chat here. Thank you. Um, and the book is available, if you want to buy the book, it's available through the website, or you can go to the site website of the publisher, which is Lulu, L-U-L-U. -L -U, yeah, I've got publishing. both of those in there. Let me see if I can get the. Uh, I think it's easier to buy it through the website because it brings you directly to the book. There's a, uh, if you go to the website, there's a box you can click that says purchase the book. Uh, I think that's easier than going to Lulu. There's the um, handout right there. And that's got both of the, uh, both a link for both how to buy it and also the, the your website about that. And then it's got all the other links in there about uh, the, for the uh, research of that. Let's see here. Um, If people go to the website, check out the blog section because uh, as I took different steps to try to try to promote the book in Italy, I described them on the blog. And okay. uh, right now, the, the best the best promotions I've had uh, are that it's uh, it's about to be used by three different high schools uh, in their classes. Uh -huh. I had it I had it translated to Italian and. Uh, uh, the Italian version is, is being used by three high schools. Oh, so very far. cool. Yeah, yeah, I forgot to tell. Uh, let me see if I've got your uh, bio here because Eric is. I have it. Okay. Well, you're, a, you're an attorney, right? Yes, but yeah. don't hold that against me. <laughs> no. Um, so he's a graduate of, of Columbia College and the University of Connecticut School of Law and as an attorney and a teacher of college courses in law. Eric gave presentations to law students at the University of Salerno in 2012 and 13. And in June 2017, Eric visited a class of graduate students at the University Federico II in Naples, where he discussed the interpretation of Ellis Island um, arrival records. Um, he continues to visit Italy as often as he can and to seek opportunities to visit universities there to discuss topics related to law and immigration from Italy. So um, are you still practicing attorney or just you just teach now? I just teach now. I teach uh, business law at a local community college. And somebody asked, could you tell us about how you approached writing your book? I started by making an outline. Uh, this is the, it went back to the to my composition classes in college, I think. I outlined the book and then I went back and wrote it from an outline. It's mm -hmm. short, it's only, it's only a 50 page book, but um, 
I mean, you can read it in a few hours and there's no, and it's, I think it moves pretty fast. Uh huh. Well, good. I, you know, I think it, uh, for me, like, I, like you said, for a heritage, um, it's so nice to have something that's written down that people can, you know, the next generation, because you lose that link and, you know, with the, the immigrant itself, it gets so far down and, and they don't know, but it's so nice to have that story. And yes. um, that's what I'm trying to do in all of this lockdown time and uh, get something yes. um, written down or, or at least gathered together so that, you know, somebody, you know, that it, people are interested in the story, not so much the dates and the names and the facts and all that. Right. So, well, I don't see any other, I sent out.